Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to another day, another week here at the Damage Report. But a day and a week, perhaps like no other, because as with virtually everything, our tech is failing, or at least LA's tech infrastructure. Uh, Francesca Fiorentini, who makes this a fantastic Monday, um, uh, is having some internet problems. So we are going to be uh, francesca which is the worst way to be. Uh, but I am still here and don't worry, while we have a lot to talk about in the first hour and even more to discuss in the aftermath. Once we get to the aftermath, we're gonna have a guest to join me to talk about something that I have probably spent more hours thinking about this year than I should have. David Auerbach is gonna join us to talk about chat GPT, AI, and all of that. What it actually is right now, strengths and weaknesses, where it's going. Um, how it's gonna be used by bad actors in the future. So a lot of fun to come um, on that. Uh, along the way, we have quite a bit to engage with, not only the entire weekend of CPAC, including what we previewed on Friday's episode of the show, which was gonna be uh, Donald Trump's big speech. That has happened and it is simultaneously so random that one couldn't have predicted virtually any of it. And then also in a larger sense, exactly what you would expect from a Donald Trump CPAC speech. So there's insane stuff there. Um, was someone calling for the end of transgender people? Uh, we're gonna watch them play fun little games where they call for genocide and then try to pretend that they didn't do that. That's gonna be um, a lot of fun. What does the word woke even mean? I'm not asking you, you probably know, you probably could do a pretty good definition of it. No, what do people at CPAC actually think? So we're gonna be engaging with that and then uh, we've been really on this beat the past few weeks of insane state level legislation. Well, we've got more of that uh, to discuss coming up. And then in the aftermath, not only chat GPT, but we've been criti critical over the past few months of Donald Trump's nicknames for Ron DeSantis. Well, he's come up with a new one. And while it is not clever, it's not dignified. I feel like it could really catch on. So I'm gonna be giving you my thoughts of that and then more bad cops, but this time not in the United States. So that's gonna be fun. Anyway, in anticipation of all of that, please hit the like button and share the stream to let people know uh, that we're here, that despite the lack of Francesca, the show will go on. And if you wanna send us any comments, tweets, or super chats, um, I'll respond as we go. Any uh, you know bits of breaking news, witty little points, funny jokes might get you a chance at a $100 Blue Apron gift card. So definitely. Uh, jump on that. Hold on a second. Oscar the Grouch in the YouTube chat says, first John shaves his face and now we don't get Francesca. This show's going downhill. <laughs> yes, those are two of the the, the, the very um, historic uh, harbingers of the apocalypse. A smooth chin and no Franny. Anyway, uh, with that said, y'all ready to do this thing? You can't answer. Well, you can't. I won't hear you, but we're going to do it anyway. Donald Trump, the big headliner of CPAC arrived at a CPAC that had a little bit of an enthusiasm problem. Not as many people were buying tickets. The speeches were all just riddled with cliches, but Trump was gonna be different. He was gonna be exciting. He was gonna enliven the whole thing. He even got a pretty good crowd considering that not as many people went. And then what did you get from his actual speech? Well, here's a little taste. People said to me, are you sure you want to do it, sir? I said, "Oh, this will be so amazing. I didn't know the word subpoena. I didn't know the word grand jury, those words, grand jury. They want to lynch you for doing nothing wrong. I didn't know they want to lynch you for doing a great job. I didn't know they want to put you away because your poll numbers are better than anybody they've seen in years. Okay. I was expecting a few more clips added on to the end of that. Well, that's gonna make things trouble, but anyway. Um, so there's a little taste of uh, how he's going to communicate around this election. Uh, the legal consequences, well, the very limited legal consequences that he's always already suffered. The impeachment, but not conviction. He didn't actually get thrown out of office. Um, and the ongoing investigations that he has right now amounts to a lynching. By the way, not a digital lynching. You know, like in the past, they have wanted to invoke lynching, but they'll add a little extra word to it to sort of weasel out of the concept. No, he doesn't do that. He's just throwing it out there multiple times in a row. He's being lynched because of this. And isn't it a great way as a responsible human being to talk about your ups and your downs to assert that when people investigate you for things that are not disputable, stealing the documents and stuff like that, we all know that he did it. 
Um, not only is that a lynching rather than a normal exercise of the justice system, um, but he won't even acknowledge that that's what it's for. It's because he has good poll numbers or whatever. Poll numbers are not great. I mean, maybe inside of the Republican Party, but that doesn't count for everything. Um, in any event, just in that little snippet right there, you had him bragging about not knowing words. He as what a 72 year old man when he first run for off, ran for office doesn't know what the word subpoena means. Despite being sued and suing people dozens of times throughout his life, he didn't know what the word meant. Uh, grand jury, he has no idea how he'd reach this age in life without knowing that, I don't know. And then the, the clincher on it in terms of the grift for me was the little ad that came in from the side to promote free Trump gold coins. <laughs> Because of course there has to be some sort of uh, BS ad component to it. I'm going to save you the trouble. Thank you for bringing that up. Oh my God, all I have to do is text to, text to get gold. I could strike it rich. How does he stay in business with this? Well, because it's not gold and you don't get it. Do I need to point that out? It, go on Truth Social right now. Like every fourth ad is about some sort of free gold they're gonna give you. The rest are about macular degeneration. I don't know what's going on with that community. Um, but anyway, it's all grift. So anyway, we had a little bit of trouble with the mashup there, but I am going to summarize a couple of the things that I think demonstrate Donald Trump's continued lunacy that makes him to people like me a agent of pure chaos, but delivers for his base exactly what he wants. So we're not gonna go super in depth in this, but a few of the things that he was talking about, I apologize. Not only are we having tech problems, but um, you might have noticed that all links on Twitter are dead. So that's fun. Anyway, um, yes, I do have those, thank you. So at one point, he, in a stream of consciousness fashion, uh, talked about the fact that he's facing these accusations of sexual harassment and rape. And I think he got a little bit confused about which one he's still being sued over because he referenced Stormy Daniels. And during his like big, I'm running for president again speech called her Stormy Horseface Daniels, which granted he's done that on social media. So maybe we shouldn't be surprised. Then he just says, no attraction, no affair. No attraction, no affair. They loved it, they loved it. Well, why wouldn't they love it? That's who he is. He does this stuff, they know They know that he did it. He know, they know that it's true. But they love the denial of reality combined with a little bit of misogynistic insults. Um, he points out, and, and there was a, a bit of a sprinkling of insane policy declarations, things he probably won't actually do, but it wasn't just insults against women. He said at one point, under my leadership, we will use all necessary state, local, federal, and military resources to carry out the largest domestic deportation operation in American history. Now this is a little bit of a, a reboot of 2016. He was saying that he was gonna do these same sorts of things too. And certainly they did deport a lot of people, but he found once he got in office that you cannot actually rally to deport 10 million people or whatever. But these are the sorts of promises that are gonna be made. So you get a little bit of the personality stuff with Trump during the speech, you get a little bit of the insane policy um, as well. He says at one point, that he is going to set up tent cities for the homeless, the drug addicted, the deranged. We're going to take them all out of our cities and we're gonna set them up outside of the cities in massive tent cities where they'll get the help that they need. And they really do sound like great facilities. I don't see why anyone wouldn't wanna go to these. So look, the reason that I wanna focus on some of these things that he's promising here is because this is not just Trump like you know, re refreshing the memory of, of his base of how deranged he can be, which they love. This is what for them passes as humor, passes as charisma. But the sorts of promises he's going to make are going to be similar at face value to what Ron DeSantis or other Republicans might make. Ron DeSantis is gonna say stuff that attacks the unhoused. He's gonna say stuff that attacks the transgender community, which we're gonna get to in a second. But is he gonna make these like blanket declarations that he's gonna deport every single person who's undocumented in America? Is he going to declare that he's gonna set up concentration camps for people who have drug problems? Presumably not the rich ones. I don't think Don Jr. is gonna accept the move. But do you think that like Ron DeSantis is gonna be willing to make those sorts of lofty promises? Now, whether any of this actually gets done or not is, is almost immaterial for the campaign. It's horrendous to even speculate about. 
um, going forward. But he just needs to make the claim. He loves throwing out these massive promises during campaigns. He'll say, you know, as he did back in 2016, that he's in support of single payer health care or whatever. What does he care? He can just say it. He doesn't have to actually do it. And I just feel like this is going to be very difficult for someone like Ron DeSantis, let alone a Mike Pompeo, who spoke at the CPAC and basically got nothing. It was it was crickets for him. Uh, it's going to be very hard for them uh, to counter some of this stuff. Let me give you a couple more of uh, the ways that he's appealing to the culture war before we move on to more truly deranged stuff. He says at one point, I will revoke every Biden policy promoting the chemical castration and sexual mutilization of our youth and ask Congress to send me a bill prohibiting child sexual mutilation in all 50 states. That should be easy and we will keep men out of women's sports. How ridiculous that will take place on day one. Uh, Reminder just for history's sake uh, or sake, um, he said during the 2016 race that he was uh, friendlier to the LGBTQ community than any other Republican. How's that working out for everyone? But that quote right there for me, it just demonstrates how easy to nullify all of the work DeSantis has done for a couple of years to generate this aura of being a culture warrior on this stuff. Like Ron DeSantis has made his entire governorship about trying to pretend that black people don't exist and their history doesn't exist and it certainly shouldn't be taught if it does exist. Um, that every teacher is probably a bisexual predator and needs to be fired and transgender people should be in the shadows or potentially worse. And he's done a lot of work to reassure his base that he's a monster when it comes to those things. So credit to him for that. Um, and then Trump can do a, a speech like this and promise that he's going to just ban all gender affirming care nationwide on day one. He's going to do all, like, forget the state level stuff about you know stopping trans people from engaging in sport nationwide. So he's gonna do this and then what is, what is Ron, Ron DeSantis supposed to do? What is his appeal to the base at that point? I, I think it's pretty easy to nullify to go on. He can also, by the way, he can do it after the fact by lying. It's a, it's an amazing trick. We banned transgender insanity from our military and signed the world's first ban on critical race theory long before anybody had even heard of the term. I have a feeling people had heard of the term before. Anyway, it was all banned. Everything was good. When Biden came in, this guy came in and he put everything right back into place where it was. So yes, you might recall that they did do a ban on transgender people openly serving in the military. It was terrible. It was terrible. Again, it was it was making a mockery of these claims he had made to be you know, more accepting or whatever. The LGBTQ community was ridiculous, but to be fair, we never should have trusted him in the first place. Um, and I do think that they had some sort of executive order about critical race theory, but he could simply say, I ban it all. You think you think Ron DeSantis was doing a good job down in Florida? I banned the entire thing, all of it, all trans people, all CRT. So uh, there goes two years of Ron DeSantis' work. I wanna give you an example of what they love about Trump. Take a look at this video. We will get rid of bad and ugly buildings and return to the magnificent classical style of Western civilization. We will support baby boomers and we will support baby bonuses for a new baby boom. How does that sound? That sounds pretty good. I want a baby boom. Oh, you men are so lucky out there. You're so lucky. You are so lucky, men. What the hell is that? You thought that when I, I, we had that first part of the video, okay? You thought, well, that's clearly the insanity he's talking about. We're going to go around the nation and get rid of bad, ugly buildings. Well, that's good. They really have been a scourge for too long. When I think about the 10 threats facing the American people, I would say bad buildings and ugly buildings, probably one and two. Um, but no, that's not it. I mean, that's crazy. And again, it's random, bizarre. What the hell made him think of that? Um, but it does actually, to be fair, it taps into this weird fascist thing that you might see on a regular basis on Twitter. There are all of these uh, like Twitter troll accounts, probably bot accounts that all have as their avatar one or another Greek or Roman statues. Have you noticed this? And they're all obsessed with architecture. 
it's this cultural thing, this hearkening back to, it's not even necessarily their culture, but it's hearkening back to when things were more beautiful and more elegant and all that. Everything's degenerate now. It's a very fundamental aspect of fascist philosophy. But anyway, to the extent that he even understands that, that's what he's invoking there. But no, but then I don't know if Trump went into this speech planning to say that we're gonna give you money to have kids or if he just landed in it because he said we're gonna support the baby boomers and then we're gonna have a baby boom and maybe a baby moon and maybe babies bounce. I don't know, he just says stuff and now he has a policy where it's gonna be checks for having kids or something. Honestly, maybe that would be a good program. A little bit of actual government support for people who've just had a child. You could maybe do like a child tax credit or something. What a novel idea. But when he blurts it out without ever having thought about the consequences of it, they kind of like it. He can throw out random things like we're gonna get rid of ugly buildings and we're gonna have a baby boom. And I think that that's that's what they want, not those individual things. They may never have thought about that and he may never mention it again, but they're fine with it. They want politics to be deranged because the more deranged Trump is, the more clearly different he is than them. And you need to understand that the people in that audience and the people watching at home are different than you in quite a few ways. Some of them probably go without saying. But one of the big ways is every single one of them, whether they would ever admit it consciously or not, deep within their bones believes that the rich are better than them. They're certainly better than you, but they're also better than them. That's why they are so slavishly devoted to people like Elon Musk, but that's why they accept this madness. They think that Trump is really on to something and he he gives them these grand ideas. I mean, they're madness, they're they're plucked from the chaos winds, but but it seems like big ideas. And Ron DeSantis, he doesn't do that. Like he can do a little bit of the attacking the trans community or something like that, but that's so easy for Trump to steal. Everyone does that. Nikki Haley does that. I don't think that Ron DeSantis can give an insane speech like you just saw. But what you just saw is just one half of this. Donald Trump is not just running to bring back American greatness or whatever. They may say that they like that and maybe on some level they they do. But there's something they want much more than a positive idea of a return to glory. Take a look at this. In 2016, I declared, I am your voice. Today I add, I am your warrior, I am your justice. And for those who have been wronged and betrayed, I am your retribution, I am your retribution. Not gonna let this happen. I mean, that's it right there. I am your retribution. By the way, can we just point out that's like an amazing Christian thing to say. (laughs) Get me into office because I am retribution in roughly human form. Like if you poured like a lot of human into a, a hefty bag, that's me as retribution. Like that's what they want. That's what they want. And that, by the way, they a lot of them get it. When Ron DeSantis says, you know, it's where woke goes to die, he's 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 signaling to his supporters or whatever, like I'm attacking all of these communities and everything. But Trump is always going to declare it more openly. By the way, he's also more willing to actually hurt people than Ron DeSantis. Ron DeSantis will do plenty of damage or whatever, but Trump cares even less. He's far more of a sociopath than Ron DeSantis. And these people want an angel of retribution, even if that angel of retribution like cheats on all his wives and all that, not actually Christian at all, doesn't even believe in any of that stuff, doesn't go to church, doesn't even need to pretend that he believes any of that. But he will give them the retribution that they desire. And that is going to be highly appealing, especially when it's combined with absolutely vicious attacks against the other candidates, which we'll get to later on in the show. Um, Now, obviously, I wanted to focus on Trump's speech since we previewed it last Friday, but he wasn't the only one to speak throughout the weekend, obviously. Most of them, they all said the same thing. I don't really feel like focusing on that. But there was one other one that I do want to talk about. Um, Let's jump into uh, this video. Talk about the geopolitical. What if you had respect for people, would you do that? They don't respect you. Read the depositions. The deposition, they have a fear, a loathing, and contempt for you. And you are the ones that can make changes. So that is uh, Steve Bannon. And uh, you know what he's talking about there? Was it, it might not have been clear from the video. He was talking about Fox News. 
He was talking about the depositions in the lawsuit from Dominion and Fox News. And he was pointing out with any any equivocation, uh, they don't respect you. And here's a weird thing to have to say, Steve Bannon is 100% right. He's being honest in a sense, an explicit sense. The words that he's saying are honest, why he's saying is deeply manipulative and dishonest. Um, but he's right. Fox view like the Fox hosts, the Fox producers, the Fox execs don't have any respect whatsoever. They have fear for their base. That's been made clear from these depositions. They are terrified of what their base will do if they're not fed exactly the type of nonsense, the conspiratorial nonsense that they want. Um, and I respect that fear. You should be afraid of them because they are monsters, monsters of your creation. But they don't actually respect them. They don't respect the reality of the lives they're living, the struggles that they're actually facing. They don't respect any of that. They're just afraid that they'll leave and they wanna keep them on the leash for a little bit longer, make more money, get a little bit more clout, all that stuff. And so Steve Bannon gets, um, he gets what's going on and he's willing to attack. You'll notice though, that while Steve Bannon technically where, how would you categorize Steve Bannon right now? You know, like I'm not talking about the political strategist part, but he's independent right wing media, right? Well, there's a lot of those. Why aren't a lot of them doing what he's doing? Like all the Ben Shapiro's, Charlie Kirk, Matt Walsh, all that. Why they're not saying this stuff about Fox News? Because again, the independent and independent right wing media has always been utterly meaningless. They are brought on Fox News constantly. They all have the same support network of millionaires and billionaires. Uh, Steve Bannon's a little bit different. He's more directly just funded by the actual grift. And that frees him up to make honest, accurate attacks against Fox News. And, and by the way, he says, we're gonna fight you every step of the way. He says they're going to take down Fox News. Now. That could be just idle words. He's a, you know, a media guy. He wants people to feel like he's a fighter or whatever. Lots of them do this. But I think that there's a real appetite for Fox to be destroyed amongst some on the right. Maybe they have some attachment to Tucker Carlson or whatever. But the other part about this that I think is worth covering, especially in connection with the speech that Donald Trump gave. And by the way, with the attacks on Fox News, Steve Bannon, he was 100% devoted to Donald Trump. He said, of the policy that Fox News has, that if Trump says something newsworthy, they'll cover it. He said no. Every time Trump opens his mouth, it's newsworthy. It was it was honestly kind of pathetic. Like that speech, it looks like he's standing up. He was he was actually fully bowed out, face on the floor the entire time to his God Emperor. Um, but when you combine that with the fact that last week we were talking about the effective shadow ban of Donald Trump on Fox News. This isn't just an idle threat from a Steve Bannon against Fox News. And I'm not saying that Steve Bannon is going to be the determining factor of whether Fox News survives this primary or not. But there is the chance that Fox could be severely harmed or perhaps destroyed if they don't play this right. I think that it's a savvy organization that is very experienced and nuanced in their understanding of how to con their base. I think that that's what they've been doing for a long time. I think they're very good at it, probably the best in the business. So uh, I think they are leaving themselves a few outs to pivot. You know, if Ron DeSantis doesn't run, or if he gets annihilated, as I'm increasingly thinking is likely to happen, I think that probably with Tucker Carlson as the leader, they'll immediately bow down to Donald Trump again. And then at that point, probably Steve Bannon will back off. If they start bringing on Donald Trump, then I think Donald Trump will love them once again. Steve Bannon will have to pretend that he didn't hate their guts or whatever. But if they don't, I mean, we know how terrified they were back in 2016. Should they be less terrified right now? Or sorry, in the wake of 2020 from the depositions. Do we think they should be less terrified right now? Again, this isn't really even about Steve Bannon, but I do think they should be afraid. Um, and by the way, the Republicans generally, this is what I'll close on, should be afraid in general in ways that we even we don't really have time to get into. So all of this that I've been discussing is what can happen if Trump destroys DeSantis and becomes the nominee? That's going to be utter chaos in a lot of different ways, really harmful to the right long term. But that's actually probably better for them than if he doesn't make it through. We had uh, Geraldo was on Fox News this morning talking about what'll happen if Trump doesn't win. And I think they're not nearly scared enough of that. So remember, this is what Fox is advocating for effectively with their tacit support for Ron DeSantis is for DeSantis to, to, to defeat Trump. 
and I guess they're just assuming that he'll just leave. He said at CPAC that if he is indicted on criminal charges, I wouldn't even think of leaving the race. Probably it will enhance my numbers. If the guy is gonna run for president from prison, do you think he's gonna stop just because Ron DeSantis wins Iowa or whatever? <laughs> I kind of doubt it at this point. Anyway, we've got a little bit more nonsense from some of the lower card performers at CPAC coming up in just a little bit and other news. So everyone stay tuned, we'll be back in just a few. Okay, hold on a second, this is funny, man, Oh God. So you guys want me to include King of Tulsa in the ranking of the Rocky movies? I haven't seen it, I've heard it's actually pretty good, but I haven't seen it. And then hold on, Bomber Raider says, John, I'm getting Emilio from Breakfast Club vibes. That ain't right, <laughs> that ain't right. Anyway, okay, look, I'm gonna keep it real. I, I don't even wanna cover this. I don't want to live in a country where one would have to cover a story like this. I hate it on its face and I hate all of the implications of it. But that said, it's a country that it is. It's the news that it is, so let's jump into this. Transgenderism must be eradicated from public life entirely. The whole preposterous ideology at every level. Okay, so that was a speech over the weekend from another pathetic little weenie whose fashion his entire life is a bad impersonation of Ben Shapiro. But anyway, he did have more to say in his genocidal rant. Take a look at this. There can be no middle way in dealing with transgenderism. It is all or nothing. If transgenderism is true, if men really can become women, then it's true for everybody of all ages. If transgenderism is false, as it is, if men really can't become women, as they cannot, then it's false for everybody too. And if it's false, then we should not indulge it. Especially since that indulgence requires taking away the rights and customs of so many people. Of course, obviously you have to turn reality on its head. He's calling for, look, let's be real what he's calling for. He's calling for the destruction of millions of people. but. What he's gonna pretend that he's calling for is just stripping away the rights of millions and millions of people. And that seems bad, especially coming from a small government conservative. So you have to flippity flip it that allowing transgender people to exist as they literally always have in every society, in every time, that takes away the rights of people for some reason. It makes no sense, but it doesn't need to. This is after all, just grift. And we're gonna focus on how obviously purposefully genocidal this is and his Weasley little attempts to avoid responsibility for that. Can we just briefly turn to, has anyone in history ever given off little pathetic minion of a bully energy than that guy? Like he should have to deliver his CPAC speech, like standing behind a larger man and occasionally leaning out to shout an insult and then hiding so he doesn't get punched in the face. Um, his little crappy grins at everything that he says because he knows the grift that he's doing. He's calling for people to be beaten and killed so he can have a nice car. That's what his life is. It's not what his life was supposed to be. Bear in mind, we know from what Brett Ehrlich has said on the show before, this is a guy who thought he was going to be an actor in Hollywood. He wanted to literally live in LA and act in movies as an artist and he couldn't hack it. So instead, he's giving speeches, bloodthirsty speeches to bloodthirsty crowds calling for people to be beaten and killed. It's weird the swerves life throws your way. But anyway, um, we're not supposed to say that he's calling for these people to be beaten and killed. We're supposed to pretend that because he's saying transgenderism, which isn't a thing, it's transgender people, they're people. It's not a thing, it's not an ism, these are human beings. He's pretending that that doesn't exist. So what he's calling for is just them to be shoved in the shadows and have all of their rights stripped away. And that's not supposed to be as horrific, it's not supposed to be as clear a violation of every supposed principle that conservatives are supposed to have. Um, but as, as much as I like pointing that out, I do wanna give credit to a friend of the show, Parker Malloy, who says, her, 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 I didn't say eradicate transgender people, I said eradicate transgenderism. And that's the game that he's playing. Let, let me demonstrate how he's playing the game. So uh, Rolling Stone did a headline that had a direct quote 
from what he said. Uh, and it was CPAC speaker calls for transgender people to be eradicated. They put eradicated in quotes because that's the quote that he said. And then he replied with this headline is libelous and I demand a retraction. And unfortunately what happened is Rolling Stone actually did the retraction. So do you see the game that we're gonna play? No, he didn't really mean that. So he sits in his little office or whatever and he thinks Matt Walsh is getting a lot of bloodthirsty fans from calling for people to be killed that are transgender. And I desperately want to be more popular than him. So I think I'll just call to wipe out the entire group. I think that's what I'm going to do. Um, seems fine. I don't know any trans people. I don't give a damn about them. I'm not going to expose myself to a single person. I'm not going to try to learn because this isn't about reality. Politics is a game. It's fun. It's a way that I make money. So I'm going to give a speech where I call for this community to be destroyed. And then when people point out that I gave a speech where I called for this community to be destroyed, I'll say, no, I added an ism to the end of it. So you're being dishonest. And every one of his fans is gonna be like, that's a good point. That's what he did, even though every one of them agrees with him that these people should be destroyed. That's the game that we're supposed to play. And unfortunately, some in the mainstream media are going to play that game. Now, look, I'm not even that mad at Rolling Stone. They're probably worried about being sued because if Michael Knowles decides to sue them, millionaires and billionaires are gonna give him millions of dollars for legal support to do that. They're gonna make it a really high profile thing because they can afford to spend these millions of dollars because it occupies the time and thoughts of their base. So their base doesn't realize how they're being screwed over by Republican politicians. It's an investment and he's an active participant in the con that's being waged on right wingers across the country. But I do wanna point out that this is what the, this is their ideology. This is what they actually are calling for. And whether he actually cares or not, I don't know. I've long criticized many of these right wingers for not actually caring about this stuff and just doing it as a performance. And I think there's certainly a, a part of that. But as I've said on the show before, I was in a green room with this little weenie once and he randomly just brought up transgender people. Nothing was going on that had anything to do with transgender people. He just brought them on. So I am willing to give him a little bit of credit that he is as weird a person as he pretends to be on TV. He does just spontaneously think about trans people randomly as he goes about his day. Lots of them pretend to do that, but probably don't. No, he really does. He'll just be sitting on a couch and he'll randomly think about how much it bothers him that people hundreds of miles away are trans. It's super weird, but I guess it's authentic. Anyway, with that said, we're gonna switch things up and talk about one other aspect, more of a meta aspect of CPAC before we move on with other news. What is woke? You hear it all the time. You really can't get away from it when you're around right wingers on social media. But what do they actually mean when they say it? Well, Insider asked CPAC attendees, by the way, my document says CPAP and I just think that's hilarious. Anyway, it's CPAC attendees. What do they mean when they say the word woke and uh, spoiler alert, they had a little bit of trouble with it. So uh, one individual says, that's tough. Let me think on it. Give me like two minutes to come up with something good. By the way, he wasn't just a random attendee. He's the CEO of a right wing dating app that explicitly declares that other dating apps have gone woke. So he is so bothered by the fact that a dating app is woke that he needed to spring to action and create an alternative. But he doesn't have anything to say about what being woke or going woke actually means, almost like it's a grift. Daniel Francis says, my opinion is they're trying to wake up what shouldn't be woken up, which again is not a definition. It's just another way of saying the same thing. They're stirring the pot in the wrong direction. I think the woke side is kind of keeping the border open. I mean, that's what they want. I don't know how many ways you can fail to answer a question, but Daniel Francis found several. So it means that you support an open border, that's what being woke is? Maybe, that like almost approaches a policy identification for what you think this ideology, I guess, would support. But they're trying to wake up what shouldn't be woken up? I don't know, I don't know. He's working it through, but he's having a hard time. Let's see, the volunteer for CPAC, Susan Vanderberg says, well, I don't have a problem with anybody being gay or anything like that which is the perfect way to lead into a paragraph of you very much having a problem with it. By the way, 
adds that she has a gay nephew. So, you know, same thing. She went on to name Pride Month, transgender athletes competing in sports, drag queens and sex education school systems as key examples of wokeness run amok. Okay, so I don't have a problem with anybody being gay, but all of these things prove that it's not just wokeness, it's wokeness run amok. It's all of these new things like sex education in school, drag queens, you know, stuff that was invented a year or two ago. Transgender athletes competing in sports, maybe we've reached a point where some athletes feel comfortable identifying the way that they truly do. That's a little bit more socially new. I got news for you though, trans people aren't new. I don't know why we need to keep telling them this. Um, Pride month, not new, none of this is new. So it seems like a pretty bad definition of woke. But anyway, there were some people, younger Republicans, who seem to understand what's going on with the use of the word woke. Chris Johnson, managing director of Young Conservatives for Carbon Dividends, likened its use to how an out of touch uncle might search for the words to describe a nephew at the Thanksgiving table. I think a lot of older folks use it if they really don't know what they're referring to. It's a catch all colloquialism. That is actually ding, ding, ding. That's exactly what it is. They have no idea what they actually mean. It just means bad. I don't like this thing or this thing makes me a little bit uncomfortable or I don't wanna have to think about something. So I guess it's woke, that's all it is. Uh, another individual, like what's the point? It says, I think that a lot of young people, when older conservatives say woke, they feel very attacked. You're turning off a younger movement of the party by labeling all young people as woke. So absolutely, I would very much disencourage that. Well, good luck. I like the idea that there are a couple of uh, younger conservatives that seem to understand that this is nonsense, that it's obviously exclusionary. Um, the, the fight, the difficult fight, I think, for those young conservatives is it isn't just that like declaring transgender people woke or gay people woke is exclusionary, which it obviously is. It's that they don't want any of these people in their party. That seems like a bigger problem than just rhetoric. You know, maybe it's a problem that you guys should work on internally. Anyway, um, maybe come up with a definition for something that you're gonna throw out there every two or th two or three times in every sentence. I don't know, seems like it'd be a good idea. Okay, with that said, let's jump to another break. We come back, we're done with CPAC for now. We're gonna see what's going on in a couple different states when it comes to uh, access to things like the abortion pill, as well as Florida legalizing kidnapping your kids. By the way, I have been fact checked. Some of the previous references were not to anime, it was to Supernatural, which I apologize, I just haven't seen. I don't know what Rick O'Connell is, um, I'm gonna have to Google it. But, um, but I'm live on air, so I can't do it right now, but I'll look into it. Anyway, with that said, we've got, I think, just enough time to get to the rest of our topics before we close out this hour. Heads up that in the aftermath, and I know what you might be thinking, I'm listening to the podcast, the show's not even live. I know, I know, but you can go to the YouTube page and you'll find these clips. We're gonna be talking with David Auerbach, about chat GPT, the future of AI, where it's going to take over your life and where it may not be able to. I think we're gonna have a lot of fun. Okay, let's jump now to other news. One of the worst aspects of the war on reproductive freedoms, the war on abortion that we're experiencing right now, is that it is not enough for these people that the actual legal victories that they get, um, that's not enough. They're getting more than that. So it's one thing when you put enough uh, you know, rabid Christian zealots on the Supreme Court, that they'll set aside all precedent and destroy Roe v. Wade. But what if abortion pills became illegal or at least not accessible in states where they are technically perfectly legal? Well, that's what they're getting and they're getting it because of the pressure that they're putting on businesses. So Walgreens confirmed just a few days ago that it's not gonna be dispensing abortion pills in 20 different states, including states where they are fully legal. They are not illegal to do, they're just not going to do it. And it's because of Republican pressure that they're putting on that company. And by the way, when Walgreens does this, when it bows to political pressure and makes it so that people can't get access to these things, they should be fully legally have accessible. You'll notice that that is a perfectly fine exercise of political pressure or whatever. If you, for instance, ask a company like Disney, like, hey, maybe you could have a gay character or something. 
That's unacceptable because it's totalitarian. In any event, here's Chris Kobach. AG for Kansas, who said in my letter to Walgreens, we made clear that Kansas will not hesitate to enforce the laws against mailing and dispensing abortion pills, including bringing a RICO action to enforce the federal law prohibiting the mailing of abortion pills. Evidently, Walgreens understood that my office was serious about this. I'm grateful that Walgreens responded quickly and reasonably and intends to comply with the relevant laws. Exactly, so they are trying to pressure these companies um, to not have those things be available. And and I guess you might think hearing that, well, that makes sense. I mean, it's Kansas after all, right? Kansas, super red state, super conservative and everything. I will remind you that just last year, they tried to outlaw abortion with a, with a ballot initiative, a referendum. Um, and that didn't go so well. Against the vote there was 59.16%. Now, that doesn't get Chris Kobach out of office. So he gets to sit in that office and pretend that the people of Kansas agree with him when it has already been definitively proven that they do not. That a belief that it should be outlawed, even in this supposedly red state, is very much a minority position. But Chris Kobach is just doing what basically everyone in right wing media does. They look out there, they understand that their positions aren't popular, that they're on the radical fringe of American politics, and they just pretend that that's not the case. So anyway, um, what I would like to see personally is if pressure can cause Walgreens to make this change, then maybe that's what we should use. Maybe putting a little bit of pressure on Walgreens to sell perfectly safe medication that is legally uh, allowed in that state. I think that seems like a very reasonable thing for a company to do. Maybe enough pressure can get them to actually do it. 19 states, by the way, already banned the prescription of abortion drugs through telehealth. Uh, meaning that you have to go to a clinician in person or find abortion medication online on your own. And if we go to this right now, uh, you can see a little bit of map of the current state of uh, medication abortion through telehealth. The blue states are the place um, that it's already uh, available, no tele telehealth medication abortion restrictions. And then you can see in many states where it's banned, you're really not gonna be surprised, I don't think, by virtually any of this. By the way, uh, we don't have time to go super in depth on this. But the war right now over access to either information about abortion online or the actual medication online is not just about whether you can go through a particular pharmacy. There's a lot of tech right now that is potentially already infringing on your privacy rights when it comes to these things and could do even more in the future. ProPublica did some great work. They ran checks on 11 online pharmacies that sell abortion medication to reveal the web tracking technology they use. Late last year and in early January of this year, ProPublica found web trackers on the sites of at least nine online pharmacies that do provide pills by mail. Abortionese, bestabortionpill.com, Privacy Pill Rx, Pills Online Rx, Secure Abortion Pills, Abortion Rx, Generic Abortion Pills, Abortion Privacy, and Online Abortion Pill Rx. So these aren't even places that have been like cowed by the right to not do it. They'll do it, but they're tracking you. And maybe that doesn't have any consequences. Maybe it never matters that they were storing your information. Or maybe someday they're gonna hand it over to a Republican state legislature, a Republican AG, a Republican governor, and they're gonna lock you up. Maybe, it's fun. And by the way, you gotta love the branding on, on abortion privacy as they wildly and repeatedly violate your privacy rights. Isn't that fun? Anyway, there's an example also where Facebook might have already contributed to the sort of hypothetical that I was just laying out right there. A woman named Jessica Burgess and her daughter are gonna be standing trial in Nebraska for performing an illegal abortion with a key piece of evidence being provided by Meta. Meta, working overtime to betray your trust and remind you of why are you still on their platforms? Maybe Instagram, you can see some fun photos or whatever, although they'll probably track you on that too. But on Facebook, honestly, why at this point? Anyway, oh my God, this hour is passing by fast. We're gonna have to move on to our final story in just one second. Um, but I wanna read one or two comments first. Bernie the Kiwi Dragon, always good to see you here. It says in the super chat, sorry about your raging headache, John, and know that we all appreciate your professionalism. Make sure you get some rest after the show. I like John Solo, a dragon story, but not on a friend day. No, I know, it's perfectly acceptable for all of you to be feeling the lack of Francesca. Hopefully we'll have more of her soon. Okay, and Smiling Dragon, by the way, sent in a super chat saying, MYODB needs to be a TYT t shirt or hoodie. Yeah, maybe. Could we do a cool design for a mind your own damn business? 
It probably already exists. Can someone do a quick check? It probably already exists. If not, we need to remind people to mind our own business. By the way, if you wanna care for other people, if you wanna experience empathy for other people, I think that's very reasonable. But making your whole life this all encompassing Karenness, it needs to stop. And the only way it's gonna stop is with social pressure, by the way. Okay, finally, let's see. Um, Melanie uh, D44, good reminder of the history here, says, woke actually was a term black people came up with to get their community to wake up and take off the rose colored glasses to rally and become more politically informed so they can start fighting white people's version, uh, I assume of history. And for those who are waking up to truth about our, our history and what's going on in the world being connected and affected. I agree, 100%. Became a little bit like in popular parlance, it became more generalized about you know sort of questioning what you'd been taught, questioning what authority is saying, but that is 100% an accurate depiction of the history. And by the way, I assume this is okay. Melanie D, I don't know if you've already gotten a Blue Apron gift card, but if you haven't, have a Blue Apron gift card. You can message rewards at tyt.com, send your first and last name and your handle, and they'll hook you up. I appreciate uh, your comment. Okay, with that said, really fast, let's jump into one more story. Florida Republicans are no longer content to just try to strip whole communities out of the education system and make gender affirming care and those sorts of things unavailable. They wanna take your kids if you participate in any of this. Here's an individual for you, Clay Yarborough, state senator in Florida, introduced SB 254 in the Florida State House. It would allow the state to seize custody of children when they're quote, at risk or quote, being subjected to gender affirming medical care, including from families where the child at question may reside outside of Florida. So that is amazing in a couple of different ways. First of all, even if it didn't have all of these extra extraneous details, it would be pretty amazing for the party of small government to be advocating for stealing your kid from you. But then when you add, it's not even just if you have gender affirming care, which is neither new nor controversial in the medical community. These are things that have existed for decades and decades and decades. That would be bad enough. If you're at risk of it, what the hell does that mean you might be asking? Oh, I don't know, it's not for me to decide. It's for Republicans in Florida to decide. And the fact that your kid may not even live inside of the state, we are getting some amazing lessons on what federalism and states rights is supposed to be about. Where more and more Republican states seem to be deciding that outlawing things like abortion inside of their state boundaries, that's fun for a bit, but it's just not satisfying long term. We're gonna outlaw the procedure for people who go to civilized states. And now we're going to take your kid who might not even be a Florida resident if we think they may someday have gender affirming care. Oh, also, we're gonna pluck migrants from uh, cities outside of Florida and then transport them to another place that's not in Florida. Do these people understand what a state is and how it functions? Well, they're obviously testing the bounds of that, trying to see what will be allowed. And the issue is that there is a body that is supposed to provide checks for this sort of thing, it's the Supreme Court. The issue is they're probably not gonna do that because they agree with all this stuff. Um, and so what you could have is, you could have a busybody a transphobe person who maybe hears a conversation in Georgia or something and thinks, you know what? I feel like these parents aren't sufficiently transphobic. I don't like that. Ergo, they're at risk of gender affirming care. And then I don't know what's supposed to happen at that point. The highway patrol of Florida drives to Atlanta and takes the kid. They have a warrant out to seize the child if the child ever makes the unfortunate decision to go to Florida. I don't know, all of this is absolute madness. This is more deranged and impossible to predict than honestly even the stuff from Gilead. I know that we've been saying that like we're moving in the direction of Handmaid's Tale. This goes beyond any of that stuff. But this is what this is what the Republican Party of Florida is all about. This is what Ron DeSantis's political uh, uh, like basically political backing is all about. And so we need to be on guard against it. With that, unfortunately, we have run out of the first hour. So if you're listening on the podcast, watching on the linear platforms, thank you so much for that. There is a lot more show to come in the aftermath though. So don't go anywhere, we'll be right back.
Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.